the police absolutely have a big role to play as the lead law enforcement agency, but different levels of government, community members and protesters, protesters also need to be part of the solution if we're going to avoid volatile open conflict in Calgary streets. The service has a job to do this weekend. And while it's fair to ask tough questions about the approach taken to date, questions that our commission is also asking, we also need to support the service as they work to pull all the levers they can to resolve this issue. These are challenging times in our city. The pandemic has taken a toll on everyone and has left deep divides. It has been hard on businesses, residents, leaders, and those who have served as police officers during this time. The service has been working all week on a new plan to address the protests, given the escalations we saw last weekend. They are all so sorry, they are also working closely with the city and provincial partners to find long-term solutions. They have heard clearly that a new approach is needed, and our commission will ensure that a new approach is used. With that, I would like now to invite Chief Neufeld to begin the services presentations. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair Cornett and members of the Calgary Police Commission. We're pleased to be here to discuss our operational planning for responding to the protests that have been going on in the Beltline community. I want to acknowledge that residents and business owners in that neighborhood, many of whom we've heard more from just this past week, I know that they have endured a tremendous amount of disruption and impact over the past number of months, and we aim to put an end to that. A lot has happened since the events of last Saturday. CPS advised that we would be making adjustments to our approach to these protests based on our experiences of March 12th. You mentioned that uh, that some of the people who were wondering, or sorry, some of the people were wondering what we were planning to do. I would just offer and ask for understanding that some of the elements of this plan were subject to dependencies, uh, such that certain pieces of the plan were not finalized until earlier today. Uh, you also mentioned that we've done this planning in concert with our members or our, our partners at the City of Calgary and also the Alberta Sheriff's and Alberta Health Services. We do appreciate the Commission's patience as you waited for us to finalize this important work. I am going to hand it over to Deputy Chief Topic to introduce the speakers, but before I do that, I'd be remiss if I didn't offer a brief word of thanks and appreciation to the members of our service and all of our partner members who continue to work very effectively together this week to deliver on the public safety priorities for our city. <clears throat> Thanks, Chief. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cornett and members of the Commission. Assisting me with the presentation today is Acting Superintendent Jason Boberich of our Public Safety Unit. He's the commander there. And Acting Inspector Peter Siegenthaler, who oversees our major events and emergency management section and is also an incident commander. I'll start with a brief overview of what we'll talk about today. Uh, first, we'll start with the strategic goal and background, talking about the mission and, and objective, as well as some background on the prior protests that we've seen. We'll talk about the uh, planning and coordination that's been going on with our partners, then get into the response and operational tactics uh, that we're, we are contemplating at a very high level, and then also talk about the evaluation and debrief that we do subsequent to these events. Next slide, please. I'll turn it over to Inspector Siegenthaler to go through the uh, strategic goal, the mission, and the objectives. Good afternoon, uh, Chair and Commission. The uh, strategic goal for the Calgary Police Service will be that uh, we will employ community engagement tactics and negotiation to aim safely facilitate a peaceful protest. The CPS recognizes the charter rights uh, to peaceful assembly. These rights are not absolute and can be, cannot be exercised in a matter that infringes on, to con on the constitutional rights of others as well as their safety. The service will respond to any unlawful and or unsafe activity in a necessary, reasonable and proportionate manner. Our objectives are gonna be maintaining the peace and uh, protect public safety, minimize community and traffic disruptions through early intervention and enforcement, to assist and support businesses and residents of private dwellings by preventing trespassing and harassment. And this will be accomplished by aiming to limit movement of large protest groups to static locations and prevent interaction between opposing protest groups. We will enforce on view criminal code and provincial statutes with immediate action or uh, post event by dedicated investigative resources 
and will provide uh, support uh, to Calgary community standards will enforce municipal bylaws and licensing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Just for a little bit of background, the what's called the Freedom Rally protests began during the pandemic. It changed locations, demands, organizers, and levels of cooperation uh, with the community and the Calgary Police Service. The crowd sizes have changed. Uh, beginning of 2022, we saw approximately 300 um, protesters. February, the range uh, uh, anywhere from two to 5,000. And at the end of February, early March, uh, approximately 1,300. Uh, also worldwide rallies uh, are advertised every six weeks, including this Saturday, March 19th. And these are national and international advertised rallies. Uh, crowds diminished as we approached the lifting of the restrictions. But beginning in March, protests continued despite lifting of the restrictions, which caused more frustration for the Beltline community. Demonstrators were re relatively cooperative, although disruptive, until last weekend, Saturday, March the 12th. Just a, a little bit, uh, very high level background on March the 5th. We had two groups. Group A, uh, approximately 800 people staged at Central Memorial Park. Group B, approximately 50 people staged at Tompkins Park. Uh, group A was continuing on their typical route. Group B formed a block on 17th Avenue and 7th Street. Uh, police were able to divert Group A north onto a new route uh, to, uh, again, a new route prior to any major confrontations. Group A was compliant with police uh, directions and a flashpoint was avoided uh, with the opposing groups. Uh, now, March 12th, which was last weekend, where we see where we saw the increase in hostility. Group A, we approximately had 1,000 people, again, staged at uh, Memorial Park. Group B, about 200 people at Tompkins Park. Uh, group A departed on their march. Group P took over uh, on 14th Avenue um, to block Group A from initiating the march. Police were able to negotiate uh, Group B to leave the roadway. What happened then was Group A uh, departed on the march. Group B formed a block on 17th Avenue and 5th Street, impeding the march for approximately one hour. Police attempted to divert the march. Uh, group A refused to comply. Negotiation with both groups provided unsuccessful. And increasing hostility and concerns for immediate flashpoints were identified. Uh, we also saw that Group A attempted to flank and surround Group B. Officers made numerous requests to both groups to move for their own safety, which they refused. And public safety unit and bike, uh, mountain bike members intervened to create a path. Next slide, please. I'll just uh, cover off uh, why now, what's changed as far as our approach. And this is a question uh, you know, that some have asked over the past week here, why at this point in time? The protests have evolved despite the removal of restrictions. So we, I think everyone expected them to, to taper off. However, they didn't do so. Uh, the community has become increasingly frustrated uh, with the ongoing disruption and the community safety concerns that come with that. And until last week, Group A had been relatively cooperative and had worked with the Calgary Police Service, often adjusting their routes uh, for a variety of reasons, whether it be construction or otherwise. Last weekend was a turning point. Uh, and what changed was that they did not follow the instructions and direction given by uh, our on-site members. When mobile, these events are become a public safety issue due to the potential for the confrontations, as we saw last weekend. And based on the totality of the circumstances, this has become a major policing event as defined by CPC policy. We have created a plan to respond to that, and we will adjust our approach. So I'll get into the injunction now. As many already know, today the City of Calgary has been granted an injunction that applies to these protests. Uh, just to summarize some of the aspects of the, the injunction, and it is available online. I know it's been circulated through social media. It prohibits the following. Blocking of traffic on roads and on sidewalks, walking in the middle of the roadways, and preventing vehicles and pedestrians from lawfully passing by or accessing amenities in the area without authorization or a permit. Conduct or activity in a park which unreasonably dis disturbs the use or enjoyment of the park for other users of the park 
or hosting an event or using an amplification system in a park without a permit. Commercial activity in a park, including but not limited to the operation of vendor stands within Central Memorial Park or other areas, again, without a permit. Uh, similar to the injunction that was in Edmonton, the unnecessary sounding of horns or other audible warning devices of motor vehicles or of other noise making devices, including but not limited to air horns and megaphones. Uh, as far as uh, the other particulars, they're available online, but the notice and serving of the injunction, the way that has to be covered off is outlined in the injunction and indicates that it may be given by reading the order to any person, including but not limited to reading the order over an amplification system, publishing the order online, including on social media accounts, or distributing copies of the order to the media, which has already been completed. For enforcement of these injunctions, any member of the CPS or any peace officer may ensure compliance with this order, up to and including arrest or detaining persons uh, that law enforcement has reasonable grounds to believe is contravening or has contravened the order. A member of law enforcement may use reasonable force in order to ensure compliance with the order. Of course, the service will always look at de-escalation as, as an introductory uh, approach, but we do have that authorization within the order. Persons shall remain at liberty to engage in peaceful, lawful, and safe protests subject to the provisions of the order. And the order shall remain in force until the hearing of the application for a permanent injunction. So this is the, the initial stage in that. So as far as planning and coordination, what we're looking at uh, as we move forward, uh, we are continuing to work with our partners. Our major events and emergency management section have been heavily involved in planning for this weekend. We're not alone in these efforts. We've engaged our partners, as you see listed on the slide there. All of us are working together to ensure that downtown remains a safe and welcoming place. These are longstanding relationships that have worked well previously with other major events in Calgary over the past several years. I'll now pass it on to Acting Inspector Siegenthaler, who will cover the planned response. Thank you, Deputy. So ongoing engagement uh, with affected uh, community residents and business owners to inform operational planning. Leading up to the protest, the Calgary Police Service has been engaging with various demonst uh, demonstration organizers to set clear expectations and directions to ensure public safety and community well-being. In collaboration with all stakeholders and ex external partners, the Calgary Police Service will provide on-duty and call-out members in a variety of roles to ensure a measured and appropriate response. The response to this event will be managed by the Calgary Police Service Incident Command Team and uh, with uh, support from multiple partner agencies. The engagement and dialogue uh, strategy to gain voluntary compliance initially employed are no longer effective and as a result of little or no cooperation from organizers, in the protests on March 12th, groups are no longer following police directions and pre-event negotiations with organizers to amend their plans have been met with resistance. Intelligence indicates that there may be an imminent public safety risk at future demonstrations. Operations will begin with the Calgary Police Service request for voluntary compliance, de-escalation when we can, and use of force when necessary to do so. Frequent briefings with all levels of command will occur uh, to adjust strategies based on the risk assessment and after action reporting. Good afternoon, uh, Acting Superintendent Bob Rewich here. With the next series of slides, I'm going to talk about the planned operational tactics. Within the service, we have a wide variety of tactics at our disposal, and the use of these tactics will be dependent on the behavior of those who attend the event. Uh, these include, but are not limited to, supporting our partners, a bylaw and city licensing with proactive engagement and enforcement. There's a potential for road closures in advance of the event, during the event, uh, as needed, depending on how the event unfolds. There will be a high visibility of public safety unit members from the Calgary Police Service, as well as additional supporting units. The traffic safety plan and associated enforcement uh, will occur in a flexible and scaled up and down uh, measure, depending on the behavior that we see. We are aware that every action that we take will cause a reaction and we must be measured and thoughtful. We will always aim for voluntary compliance. We'll utilize de-escalation when we can to the fullest uh, attempt 
and use force when we must. So be a direct dialogue, and this is ongoing uh, during, before, and after the event with the organizers, the public, and the community to request voluntary compliance. Additional social media and communications are being utilized to request compliance with refraining from attending the area for the purpose of protesting. Our intention is to focus resources on mitigating risk, changing the behavior of those who cause community disruption and negatively impacting public safety in the area. We have a robust communication strategy and we're supported by our strategic communication sections who will have staff on scene to manage media as required as well as in our tactical operations center. This week, we plan to use social media to provide real-time updates to the public about the events as they unfold. This will focus on crowd dynamics and behavior while balancing the needs for officer and public safety. This has been done successfully by other jurisdictions to assist with public safety during the event and increasing transparency and ultimately building and ensuring trust. Spokespersons will not be made available at the scene. Uh, all media availabilities will occur at West Winds to reduce the impact of media and cameras uh, that they have on the crowd. Uh, we'll continue to engage directly with our businesses, the BIAs, community associations, and through our CROs after the event. And I'll go back over to Deputy Tofik. Thanks very much. Uh, there's been often questions around how, how individuals can help or contribute to making this a better situation. Uh, so just for information for everybody, uh, de-escalation and community well-being is everyone's responsibility and everyone can contribute to this. Uh, we will be putting out social media as Jason indicated. So sharing of official messaging coming from our, uh, our, our Twitter feed and social media would be beneficial. Uh, be mindful of your own safety and your own jeopardy if you choose to go to that location uh, for the purposes of protesting. Should a flashpoint or other situation occur, we will provide you with an update on conclusion of the event. Sometimes we don't have the ability to give the update right in the moment. We are all in this together and consistent messaging will aid in bringing calm to a situation and build trust with the community. For the CPC's benefit, if, if there's any questions or concern, we have the CPC executive director that's a resource uh, for everyone. So at this point, uh, I'll conclude the presentation there. We'll, be, we'll turn it up back to the chair. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I would like to um, ask two questions to clarify, um, just uh, and then any um, other comments before we move to the conversation with media. Um, the first question is, uh, just for clarification, it came up in our conversation earlier. Um, can you describe a little bit more about the difference between ticketing through the bylaw process and the difference that this injunction will make? Sure, thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's a very significant uh, difference uh, that you uh, raise here. So bylaws and uh, tickets under the provincial legislation would result in a what we call a, uh, a summons or a ticket issued to somebody. And so they would get that at the roadside as you know, very similar to how anybody would receive a ticket when they're driving. You get the ticket and then of course you go on your way uh, and you uh, could continue to engage in the activities. What the injunction does is it actually prohibits uh, any of those behaviors that we talked about. So the injunction was specifically crafted so that it, it brings into, uh, into its uh, four corners the most problematic of the behaviors that were impacting on the Beltline. So marching in the protests, noise makers, horns, amplification devices, these types of things, you could actually be arrested. Uh, once you're aware of the, uh, of the order and its existence, you can be told stop doing that. And if you continue to do that, you can be arrested right there and go directly to jail. So it's, it's much, much more powerful. The impacts are much, much more immediate. And I would, I would think that the deterrent on behavior would be much more um, significant. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, um, I know there are many questions and other things to, um, to delve into, and this was not the end of this conversation. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. 
Um, we want the community to know that we will continue working closely with the service, with city council and the Beltline residents and businesses to ensure these disruptions end. In fact, the commission will be meeting with city council immediately after this meeting to further discuss next steps. We know you have been patient over the last two years and we're working hard to give you your community back. I would like to now adjourn the public portion of this special meeting and thank you to everyone for coming today. The Calgary Police Service members and members of the public can now leave the meeting. Commissioners and councillors may choose to take a break before our next meeting and the chief and I will stay on to take questions from media. So thank you very much for your time today. More conversations and discussions must be had and they will. So I'll turn it over to Corwin. Will you please queue up reporters now? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we have a few reporters who have pre-registered and then um, we can work through the other list if there's others who wish to also ask questions. Adam McVicker from Global News is our first stop. Go ahead, Adam. You guys hear me yes you can okay perfect sorry about that um chief i would like to just uh, maybe repeat the question that um chair Cornette asked you but you know will will calgary police make arrests tomorrow if they find people contravening with the um with this with the issues laid out in the injunction yes And I guess a follow-up, uh, visually, what, what, what could residents maybe expect uh, in the Beltline tomorrow? Will there be a, what, what kind of police presence will be in the area to prevent perhaps a, a similar clash that we saw the last two weekends? Thanks, Adam. Yeah, good question. And I wasn't trying to be coy the first time there, but that, that's the answer. Yes, we will. Uh, so residents uh, in the Beltline in the downtown area will see a significant police presence tomorrow. Uh, one of the uh, potent pieces of the uh, current injunction is that it actually prevents people from going mobile. So one of the most difficult parts has been the marching, uh, more so than the uh, events in Central Memorial Park, the marching and then going down to the Beltline, which is having the impact there, and then also running the risk of, of actually uh, two protest groups getting together, as we saw last week. So the, there will be no marching tomorrow. There will be no mobile protest and uh, there will be nobody uh, behaving that way down on the Beltline. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. We will now move on to Brittany Gervais from Post Media. Go ahead, Brittany. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Um, just to get a little bit more information on uh, crowd, con uh, crowd control efforts for tomorrow, um, I think uh, the chief there just said that there will be no marching tomorrow um, and nobody behaving as we've seen in previous weekends. Uh, what kind of um, efforts or uh, specific, um, I guess, enforcement measures could police do uh, in terms of crowd control for tomorrow? Hi, Brittany, Acting Superintendent Jason Bobrovich. Uh, it's a really good question. And ultimately, we, we have resources that are in place with our protest liaison team officers that are already proactively engaging uh, the groups. Uh, they have been provided copies of the injunction. They are laying the groundwork for uh, obtaining voluntary compliance. Should that not occur uh, down in the Beltline and along 17th Avenue tomorrow, then we'll be working with our partners through bylaw city licensing to conduct pre, uh, during, and after event enforcement. We'll also have the full gamut of uh, municipal, provincial, and federal uh, statutes that we can have also to use enforcement. The objectives, again, as the chief stated, are to not have any group march, uh, to have a peaceful protest, and to very much limit the disruption within the downtown uh, Beltline area and along 17th Avenue. We, we ideally want it to be business as usual uh, within the core. Okay, I have a follow-up if you. I can. Yep, if you have a follow-up, please go ahead, Brittany. Perfect. Okay, um, just um, 
I think police mentioned that they were in communication with both groups. I uh, wanted to see um, after that, you know, they've been delivered this injunction or copy of the injunction. Um, is there, does, do police have, that, police have any indication around what their in, both groups' uh, intentions are for tomorrow? Um, or did they express any intent that they'll, I guess, still be protesting um, tomorrow? At this time, those engagement uh, opportunities are still underway. It's still in the early hours. The uh, injunction uh, was only announced within the last several hours uh, via uh, a variety of social medias, including mainstream media uh, portals. Uh, those conversations will be ongoing. Uh, members that are deployed down to the belt line as well tomorrow will have hard copies uh, to be able to provide to any incoming uh, participants to the events. So at this point, we don't have any confirmed um, actions or voluntary compliance or disagreements with the injunction, but we'll continue to work on that right up to the point and including during the event. Hey, Brittany, are there any, any further follow-ups? Um, no, I, I guess, you know, with, with those crowd control efforts from before, are there any specific examples that police can give? I know there was some... Um, uh, controversy around uh, some enforcement efforts that were used last weekend. So just wondering about any specific actions. We have a variety of, we have a variety of options that are available to us. We obviously want to always uh, maintain the de-escalation uh, as a, a forefront to obtain voluntary compliance. However, uh, should the behavior of the protesters dictate uh, that we use force, then it will be used with a variety of different uh, capabilities uh, in a uh, necessary and proportionate and uh, manner. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Brittany. We will now move on to Paula Tran from Global Radio. Sorry, Paula, we didn't actually have you queued up. So we will instead go right to um, James Keller at the Globe and Mail, and then we will circle back to you. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask, in terms of the Memorial Park, what is the plan there? I mean, are people going to be allowed to protest? A lot of the activities that they have been doing, like setting up speakers and you know loudspeakers and that sort of thing seem to be prohibited. So what is permitted in the actual park, the kind of the their sort of rally and staging ground? Hi, Jason, or Jamie, I, I might, might have missed it there. Yeah, the people can actually go down to the park. The litmus test we're using is uh, what activities would we allow any member of the community or anybody that goes down there to do. Uh, if people go down there and they do those things, then that's permissible. The injunction is actually quite potent though with respect to uh, any sort of activities, amplification of sound, um, air horns, yelling, anything that would be you know, significantly disruptive would be covered by the injunction. So again, people could go down there as I say, and they could use the park in the way that you, know, you or I or, or you know, the average Calgarian would, and that would be completely permissible. And I have a, a follow up. Uh, you know, last or on Monday, you described the counter protest group as involving, you know, quote unquote, professional protesters who didn't live in the belt line. Do you regret that? I mean, that seems to have struck a nerve among some of the residents who, you know, do in fact live in the belt line and have pointed to the larger protest group who, you know, some of them, as you, you, know, you noted in the injunction, are making money uh, and are sort of, you know, profiting off this and clearly do not live in the neighborhood. Thanks. Yeah, I think it was interpretation of the word professional. So I saw where some people thought uh, that I was referring to people, you know, being compensated or making money. What I was sort of trying to get at there was individuals who we have identified to be multi-issue uh, protesters or activists. So folks that you see uh, out protesting at whatever the event or the cause might be. So some of those individuals were involved there as well. And some of them are folks that we know not to be residents of the Beltline. Okay, thank you, James. Paula, we will now move on to you. You're free to unmute. We can't hear you, Paula. Oh, 
Okay, we will try to follow up with Paula. Um, now we'll go to Jeremy Colossus from the Sprawl. I do see a few other people with their hands up in, in the queue. If you can change your name to also include your media outlet, that would be appreciated. Ahead, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Uh-oh. Just wait, just wait, just wait. We can hear you. Hello? Can anyone hear me? We can hear you, Jeremy, yes. Shoot. Okay, um, Paula, do you want to, to go now? I saw you pop up on the screen and we'll circle back to Jeremy. Hi, can you hear me? We can, Paula, yes, go ahead. Hi, um, so this is a question anybody can answer, um, but we've been seeing social media reports of um, allegedly white supremacist groups participating in the protests. Is this something CPS is aware of? We have had people at times uh, that have participated in the protest groups that we are aware of that had connections or affiliations to white supremacist groups. Uh, yes, we are aware of it. And a follow-up, if I may. Absolutely, um, please go ahead. So I guess picking Piggybacking off that question, um, I guess has there any has there been any efforts to mitigate, I guess, these kinds of involvement, considering the dangers this may have towards Black, Indigenous, and racialized residents in the area? Yes, thank you. When we have had uh, knowledge of individuals from uh, those types of groups uh, participating in the protests, there has been attention paid to them. And certainly if any uh, individuals would commit an offense that would have been uh, arrestable or something we could have uh, dealt with, we, we would certainly look to do that. Okay, thank you. Excellent, thank you, Paula. We'll go back to you, Jeremy. And uh, then we just as well need the people with their hands still up to uh, identify their media outlet, please, to be called on. Go ahead, Jeremy. Perfect, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Something got messed up before. No um, my question is for Commissioner Cornett, and it's about the role of the commission in all of this. Um, and I'm trying to figure out uh, kind of what oversight looks like for the commission in this situation, because, you know, last Saturday we had a group of residents who went down, uh, who came out onto the streets because trust had been broken. Uh, with the police service or they felt like police weren't going to do anything about what was happening in their community. Uh, then you have this altercation and then, um, and then you have the police chief basically saying, you know, uh, there's agitators on both sides, both sides are responsible for what happened on last Saturday. So my question is, uh, what assurances do Calgarians have that uh, that the commission is actually scrutinizing the police service and in particular what went on last Saturday and in recent months. Uh, and what does that scrutiny look like? I know the immediate concern is uh, what happens tomorrow, but, uh, but yeah, what does that look like? Because there's, there's been a tension like this throughout the commission's history in terms of is the commission actually scrutinizing the police service or acting almost as a mouthpiece for the police service? And here we are Friday afternoon uh, coming out of a closed door meeting. And this is basically, you know, a joint press conference of sorts and then a closed door meeting again. So I understand tomorrow's the main issue, but in terms of the long term, what does that scrutiny look like? Thank you for your question, Jeremy. Um, and it's a very good question and one that um, we on the commission wrestle with on a regular basis. Um, there is, and um, I expect always will be a tension between um, the issues of oversight and governance versus direction and operations. Um, so that being said, there also needs to be um, transparency for the commission to the people that we represent, which is the community. We're appointed by council to 
bring forward the, um, the needs and the requirements of the community, ensure that this is a safe city to live in. So um, the, this, the conversations we've had over the months um, and the years have been um, about this. Now we've seen um, escalation of the situation over the last short period of time. There certainly have been um, discussions with the service over the last certainly five, six, seven months. Um, these need to continue and will. Um, and I will say going forward, um, you know, we've, we've worked over the last little while to try and do different things with our communication processes as commission. And we're still working on that. Um, and, and it needs to change, it needs to get better. I will also say that um, our work, you know, after we finish with this weekend, um, will actually start to ramp up even further because we need to look at what has gone on, what we've done, have we been doing the things that we needed to do? Um, and so there's lots of discussions to happen. So I, I take your question very seriously. It's certainly one we've asked ourselves. Um, we are meant to be an independent objective per body in, between, in, in the center of all of the things that go on in the city with respect to the police and, and the safe communities that we are trying to promote. So um, there's more to be done, absolutely. And uh, we need to make sure that people see that we are doing the work that, that we have been appointed to do. I don't know if that is specific enough for you, but um, at this point, um, we have a lot of work to do, I will say. We have been working on this and we need to continue to communicate properly. And, and what, do, what does that look like in terms of uh, the police chief? You know, after last Saturday, a number of community members uh, calling for Chief Newfeld to be fired. Um, is that a consideration? And what does the commission do with that at this time or after tomorrow? Well, I, I, I'll start by saying again that the, the police have a job to do this weekend. And I fully support and thank all the officers and civilian employees who've been working over the month on this and especially over the last couple of weeks. Um, right now, it, it's not the time to undermine or second guess the police um, going forward over this next short period of time. That being said, we will look um, at what has transpired and have those conversations um, and have the discussion with the full commission um, and others that may need to be involved. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Um, so that is um, all we have in line for media. I do apologize to those with their, their hands up to speak. Uh, this was intended just to be an opportunity for media. Um, we are not, uh, not in a position right now to provide a public town hall. Um, and so we are going to, to end it there. And I will pass it back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank um, all the, the members of the media and the service itself for all of the work you've done today and in the past and uh, appreciate everybody's time this late on a Friday afternoon with lots going on. So thank you very much. And uh, with that, I will adjourn this meeting.